Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have you all back. You've had your coffee break, and uh, we're going to get into the second part of the afternoon. Remember, we're in Book 78. Well, I can't keep track of them anymore. But uh, we're beginning the next 12 programs, going into that next book, and we're taking sort of subject matter today. We're looking at Christ as the rock and the stone of Scripture. And uh, for this half hour, we're going to look at the stumbling aspect of the stone and uh, how that Israel was prophesied to do it, and they did it, and uh, they still are stumbling over that rock of offense. So we're going to start our scripture this, uh, in this half hour in Psalms 118, verse 22. And while you're looking that up, and for those of you out on television, again, we just want to invite you to a Bible study. That's all we hope it to be. I, uh, I don't feel like I'm an evangelist, although if you'd read our mail and how many people are getting saved, you'd kind of think so. But, uh, you know, only once or twice in all the 30 years that I've been teaching, somebody would come up and say, Les, you should have given an invitation. And uh, one of them was at one of our times in Jerusalem last, uh, last fall. And uh, we had a little over 200 people on that tour, and for one reason or other, I was. I was kind of wound up that night, even though uh, it was a long day. But I think I had a nap for a little while before, didn't I? Yeah, and boy, when we went to that, I was wound up. And uh, there again, uh, several people said, Land, Les, you should have given an invitation. <laughs> but I've never considered myself an evangelist or a preacher. I, I prefer to just, just be the teaching end of it and let the Scripture speak for itself. All right, now in Psalms 118, then, verse 22, we have that exact language. The stone which the builders refused, and it's become the headstone of the corner. Now, you have two opposites there, don't you? Now, I've referred to it before in the program. I think it's more legend than anything, but yet Scripture certainly supports that something like that might have happened. That while they were building the temple, whether it was Solomon's or Herod's, uh, the second temple, it's irregardless. That uh, seemingly, since all the stones were cut exactly out at the quarry, wherever that was, so that there was no hammering and chiseling at the building site. And so probably through a mistake of the quarry workers, they sent one of the keystones that was waiting for the later end of the building, they sent it too early, and the builders on the building site couldn't figure out where it was to go, and so naturally, as men would do, they rolled it off to the side, and the weeds grew around it, and it became a stone of stumbling. Well, I like that analogy because that's exactly what happened. You see, when Christ came the first time, Israel, like those builders, didn't know what to do with him. Think about that for a minute. They should have. They should have been able to search the scriptures, but they didn't. And so they rejected the stone of stumbling by crucifying him and literally screaming, we'll not have this man ruling over us. But you see, the last half of this verse is prophecy, and it's still prophecy, but it's coming. We're getting closer and closer every day for the return of Christ, and then it will be in total fulfillment of all these prophecies where he will indeed yet become the headstone of the corner of all these promises that have been given to the nation of Israel. Now we're not talking about a building per se of stone and mortar, but we're talking about a spiritual concept how that when Christ will finally come and set up this glorious earthly king kingdom and be king of kings and lord of lords, then that building will become complete. And of course, he is the cornerstone, the headstone, or anything else that you want to put on that which is the most important. But here again, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused. Now just get the picture. It came from the quarry. It came to the building site. And the builders didn't know what to do with it, so they rolled it aside. And it became a stone of stumbling. 
But the end result is he's still going to be everything that he claimed to be. All right, now let's just jump ahead a little bit to Isaiah chapter 8. <clears throat> and again, we have the same concept. Now I'm going to keep repeating all afternoon that this is a concept between God and Israel. Now Paul is going to refer to the stone of stumbling, but he's going to refer to it with regard to Israel. And we'll see that maybe in this half hour, otherwise one of the later ones. But the rock and the stone concept is between God and Israel. <clears throat> All right, Isaiah chapter 8, and drop down to verse 14. Well, let's look at verse 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense. See how clear the language puts it? Now, this is prophecy. This is looking forward to Israel's future. Now, remember, we're having it in two events. His first coming, he was the rock of offense. And how the vast majority of Israel ended up hating him, detesting him. Even Saul of Tarsus put people to death for following this imposter. See? But... And, and this is the whole concept. It, it, it's done a lot for me the last few weeks as I've been mulling these things over. And last night, Iris looked at me with a blank look. It was just after supper. And I said, you're wondering what I'm thinking? And she says, yeah. I said, tomorrow afternoon. Well, these things just keep rolling and rolling. And the more you think about it, the clearer the picture becomes that all through Israel's history, God has these promises but before the promises come, what had to come first? Chastisement, discipline, see? And so the same way here. First, he's going to be the stone of stumbling, his first coming. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? See, that was their attitude. And they finally ended up with crucify him. We'll not have this man to rule over us. But see, here we've now come 2,000 years, and I said in the last taping, remember, God is timeless. How long in God's thinking is 2,000 years? Nothing, see? And so almost like a snap of the finger, he's ready to come back and fulfill the other half of these. Instead of being the rock of offense and the stone of stumbling, he's going to be the headstone of the corner. He's going to be the king of the glorious kingdom. All right, so he shall be, verse 14 again, he shall be for a sanctuary but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. Now remember, the Old Testament is always dealing with the northern kingdom of the ten tribes, the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin. That's why we so often see it split like it is here. But he's going to be the same for all of them. Don't think for a minute those ten tribes were ever lost. They are just as complete a part of Israel today as they were way back at the beginning. You know, that was a false, false concept that was promoted primarily by Ted Armstrong. And of course, others have followed along it, and they still try to promote the fact that the ten northern tribes were lost. No, they weren't. They were never lost. Some of them went into captivity, but I, whenever somebody calls on it, I just tell them, well, now listen, you just get out your Bible, and you start reading Israel's history back there in Chronicles and Kings and keep track of the civil wars. Keep track of the civil wars between Judah in the south and the ten tribes or Israel in the north. And they did. They had civil war. Well, the very first civil war, the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah could only put out a few hundred thousand. But the ten tribes in the north could put out a million three hundred thousand. Well, that was to be expected. They had five times as many more people. And it showed in their numbers of armed forces. All right, then about five, six years after the first one, they had another one. And already the numbers had almost evened out. Judah was now able to put almost as many troops in the field as Israel. And then 30 years later, the scripture says that Israel's army was like a bunch of kids 
goats. They were worthless. There was nothing. And Judah had millions. Well, now common sense ought to tell people what started happening just as soon as the nation divided. The people from north start migrating down south. Why? The temple was down there. And that was the heart of Israel's life. And so over the years, they migrated, and they migrated, and they migrated. So that by the time Sennacherib come in and took Syria captive, there weren't that many Jews left up there, see? They're all down in Judah. All right, now if you follow it a little further, and I didn't intend to do this, I'm rambling. <laughs> now you follow it a little further. Who comes and takes Judah captive? Well, Nebuchadnezzar. Takes them all out to Babylon, present-day Baghdad. And what does the scripture say? Two tribes? No. The whole house of Israel was taken captive. And then when they came back, even though it was only a small percentage of the whole, 44,000 or whatever it was, but what were they? Representatives of all the tribes. All Israel came back. And then just to show how it held together up through history, when Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.36, and they're asking, now what shall we do? What does Peter say? Therefore, let the whole house of Israel Israel know assuredly. Well, who's the whole house of Israel? Judah and Benjamin? Why, heavens no. All 12 tribes. So if you've ever been dangled with that idea that some of the Jews were lost or the tribe lost, you forget it. And I'm even forgetting the most important one of all, Revelation chapter 7. When they sealed 12,000 from each tribe, how many did they end up with? 24,000? How many, Luther? 144 which when I was in fourth grade was 12 times 12. I think it still is, right? So all 12 tribes are even represented at the beginning of the tribulation. So what is the matter with these people? So if you ever get dangled with that in front of you that some of the Jew tribes are lost, you just forget it. Not a one was lost, see? All right, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. All right, now then I think I can jump all the way up to the New Testament. Let's go up to Acts chapter 4. And now remember, it's all still Jewish. Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 4. Now again, verse 11 is the verse we want to look at, but let's feed into it. Let's get the flow. Let's go up to verse 8. Peter is addressing the Sanhedrin, the religious, not the religious leaders, but the political leaders. So in verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we be this day examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. That's back there in chapter 3 when they healed the lame man, you remember, and he was leaping for joy. All right. Verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, the resurrected, ascended Lord, his power is still evident. All right, even by him doth this man stand before you whole, healed completely. Now verse 11. This, this Jesus of Nazareth, whom you rejected, whom was crucified, was buried, rose from the dead, ascended back to the Father's right hand, and is waiting to yet fulfill the other half of the promise that he's going to be the headstone of the corner. All right, that's what the verse says. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Now, you're getting the picture. It's the same concept that when the headstone of the corner came in ahead of time and the builders couldn't figure out where to put it, they just said, out with it. And they rolled it off into a vacant lot. Now I'm just using that as an illustration. 
putt, even though it became a stone. In fact, I was thinking of it, I think, driving up. I know it happened to me one time when Iris and I were still able to go to Colorado every summer, and we'd go trout fishing up in the mountains, just the two of us. And uh, one night I went out after dark and uh, got off the path a little bit, and I did. I stumbled on a stone about that big, and hit me right in the shins, and you know what that feels like to get kicked in the shins by a stone of stumbling. Well, you see, that's what happened to Israel when Christ came the first time. He just literally kicked them in the shins and they couldn't get over it. All right, so now Peter says the same thing. This is the stone, speaking of the Christ that healed the lame man. See? Not the Christ in his earthly ministry now. He's already ascended back to glory. But the ascended Lord from glory was still the power that healed the lame man. And so Peter says, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. See what he's driving at? They were the leaders of Israel, the Sanhedrin, and along with the priests. And they rejected him out of hand. But Peter also gives rise to that which is still future. And that is, he's still going to be the headstone of the corner. Only in symbolic language now we're talking. Speaking of when he sets up this glorious kingdom over which he will rule and reign as the God of creation. See? All right. So this is the stone. That has become the head of the corner. But now come back to verse 12, and I'm mindful of this because you know of the poll that was taken about a month ago, how that the vast percentage of Americans from all various denominational backgrounds are now claiming that there's not just one way to heaven. You can pick and choose. You're seeing it. I read an article again last night referring to that same poll where people no longer have the concept that there is only one way of salvation. Now, the reason I thought of that is this next verse. This is the verse that we have to rest on. This is the verse that 80% of American church people are rejecting out of hand. It's scary. How long am I going to be able to teach the way I teach? I sometimes think it won't be long. In fact, I think if my ministry is getting the world ready or getting America ready for anything, it'll be like China did when the communists took over in the 40s. What happened to the church? Went underground. And it survived all those horrible years with house churches. I think we're getting ready for the same thing if the Lord tarries. Because Christendom today does not like the truth. It's evident. All right, but see now Peter goes on in verse 12. This is where we stand. Neither is there salvation in any other. Can't be. And so whenever you have groups holding in hand who are Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists and Pentecostals, hey, it won't fly because they don't agree on this. They will never agree that there is only one name given among men whereby we must be saved, see? And that's where we get separated. That's where we get pushed off to the side. All right, so read it again. This headstone of the corner, this stone rejected of the builders is the one in whom there is salvation alone, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. And beloved, don't ever forget that. Don't ever compromise that. There is not a second or an alternative way to glory. All right? Now I think I've got one more. Romans chapter 9. Starting at verse 30. But now remember, just because Paul is writing it, this still doesn't take away the Jewish concept of the stone and the rock. Because chapter 9 is part of the three chapters that Paul deals with the nation of Israel. And so this, again, the language is evident. Romans chapter 9, we'll start at 
verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles to whom he's ministering, that the Gentiles who followed not after righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, see, here we come back to where we are. But Israel, who followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, or why? What was their problem? Because they sought it not by faith. It was a works religion, see? And it's no different today. My goodness, most of Christendom is hung up on it's what we do. And it's not what we do, it's what God has done. But they can't swallow that, see? All right, so that was Israel's problem from day one. All right, where, wherefore, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. That was Israel's standard, see? For they stumbled at this stumbling stone. What stumbling stone? The next verse. For as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's Jerusalem. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. That's what he was to the most of Israel. But there was, again, that small remnant that believed who he was, that followed him as their Messiah. That was the group that Saul of Tarsus tried to obliterate with his persecution, see? And so what was the end result for them? They believed, and they'll never be ashamed. In other words, disappointed is, is another word that I like there better. Why? Because they put their faith in that rock of offense who to them was not a stumbling stone, he was the cornerstone. See that? And so it is all through God's dealing with Israel. All right, let's go to one more yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And again, it's the same thing. Paul is speaking, but he's referring to Israel and their relationship with this stone of stumbling. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter one. Oh my goodness. These are too good to pass up. We're going to start at verse 18. All got me? All with me? First Corinthians chapter one, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, to the lost world, foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it's what? The power of God, see? And that's where the world misses it. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, those of you who were with us in the last several tapings, when's all that going to happen? Well, during the tribulation. When the wrath of God will finally be poured out, grace will be brought to an end. And unbelieving humanity is going to come under the wrath of God. It's going to be unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, I've been reading a book. It was real interesting. Showing the comparison of the eschatology of Islam, or the Mohammedan religion, compared to the eschatology of our Bible. And you know, it's shocking. It is, I don't want to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to be sensational, but it was shocking because you all know this guy down in Tehran is talking about the coming of the Muslim Mahdi, the M-A-H-D-I. And the Muslim Mahdi is what we would call the biblical Antichrist. But here is the shocking thing. He quotes, 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 how that the Muslim Mahdi is identical with the biblical Antichrist. See how close we're getting? So if the Antichrist is Muslim, then it all puts in place. See? But whatever. I just, I couldn't believe the constant 
comparisons as how identical they are, except that from the Muslim point of view, it's their Mahdi and it's our Bible's Antichrist. They're going to do the same thing, only instead of the Antichrist, as we see it from the Bible, is going to have the false prophet funnel people to a worship of the Antichrist, the Muslim Mahdi is going to also be helped by their concept of the biblical Jesus, only he's not going to be the biblical Jesus. He's going to be a corrupt, but nevertheless, he's going to work hand in glove with their Mahdi like our false prophet of Revelation will work with the Antichrist. Oh, it's just unbelievable. And all I could say as I read the book, how close are we really getting? We're just getting, you can almost hold your breath. <laughs> we can almost hold our breath. But anyway, where was I? 1 Corinthians 1, still back to verse 18. Now 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, with all of our technology, with all of our computer smarts, and I still have to sit and tell, how did that guy figure it out? I mean the computer. <laughs> how does he figure it out? I mean, it's just beyond this simple mind of mine. But see, this is what the scripture is talking about. That kind of wisdom is going to be brought to nothing, see? No, no, I've got to hurry. I'm running out of time. All right. For out after the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that what? Believe. Now here we're coming. For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a what? A stumbling block. See that? The Jews consider this gospel of grace a stumbling block because it's that stone of stumbling that's at the heart of it all. All right? So to the Jews, he's a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks, it's just so much foolishness. But I made my point. All the way through Israel's experience, who's the stone of stumbling? Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.